Just like plants have seasons, so do wild mushrooms. I like to experience every mushroom season by going to some places over and over again. I'm not going to those places to pick loads of one kind of mushroom to eat and stock up on. I'm going out to learn and experience a lot of different kinds of mushrooms. There are so many wild mushrooms that are enjoyable to eat if you get to know them one by one. And even if a mushroom is not good to eat, they can still be worth getting to know. There's an incredible variety out there. Hey, welcome to Haphazard Homestead. I'm Holly Chris. I'm glad you're here. So come along with me out into the woods and then back into the kitchen here to cook up a wild mushroom dinner. We're headed out towards the coast in western Oregon. Look what's growing here on a stick covered in moss. It's the cat's tongue, Pseudohydnum gelatinosum. Now that's a long name for a little mushroom, but look close and you can see the underside really does look like a cat's tongue. I always enjoy seeing these and usually take home a batch to eat. Look what else is growing in this moss. They're so furry, a furry mushroom. Now this is one of the woolly inocybes and they are not for eating at all. No, don't think about it. But aren't they beautiful? Here's a really tiny mushroom down in the moss on a twig. It's a bird nest fungus. Do you see those little eggs down in the nest? When a raindrop hits the nest, it pops out those eggs that are really packets of spores for reproducing the mushroom. And here's one more completely different mushroom that tells me this place has not always been a Douglas fir forest. This is the oak maize gill, and it grows on oak trees. So this area had oak trees at one time, and the Douglas firs around here were planted. Now look at this strange mushroom. That's an elfin saddle, the western black elfin saddle. I have to look close at this to make sure there is no mold anywhere because I'm taking it home to eat. There are some important precautions with this mushroom that I'll share with you when I'm cooking it back in the kitchen. Huh, take a look, this is a little donkey ear. Yeah, that's a completely different looking mushroom. I'm not eating that either, but isn't it cute? Let's take a look and see what we're gonna find down by this creek. It's a completely different environment. Look at this rotten mushroom. I can still tell though that it's the dyer's polypore, which is good for dyeing fabric. How can I tell? Because I've been checking this specific individual mushroom for three months. I've been watching it change from being young to being rotten. That helps my brain imprint on what the mushroom looks like under any conditions. Now look at these pretty purple lilac mushrooms. Don't be fooled. They're another inocybe related to those brown furry ones earlier. These are toxic. Don't even think about eating them, no. I'm still taking them home though, so I can keep looking at them for a few days to keep my eyes and brain trained on these so I never mistake them for a bluet, which is a really delicious wild mushroom. So I didn't find anything to eat down here by the creek. I've got another spot to check in some older forest, but there's always something interesting to see anyway. Do you see those little birds out in the creek? Watch their eyes and check and see if you can see any white flashes, especially from that young one up front. These are American dippers and they have white feathers on the top of their eyelids. So every time they blink, it looks like their eyes flash. That's amazing. Okay, here we are at the edge of a patch of really old trees. Some of them got cut down a long time ago. Take a look at the base of this Douglas fir tree stump. <laughs> See those yellow glops? I'm gonna take those home to eat, yes indeed. Now there are other mushrooms that look similar to this, and some people would call all of them witch's butter, even though they're not even related. But this one is the only one that grows on a conifer tree. And so it's more precise to call it the conifer orange jelly mushroom or Dacromyces chrysospermus. So there's no mix up on which mushroom it really is. Here's a bracket fungus that seems really hard and usually it is, but we're here just at the right time so I can cut off the softest edge. That edge is still too tough to chew, but I'm gonna make a drink with it. That's the red belted conch. Its newest scientific name is Fomatopsis mounciae, but in a lot of older books, it's Fomatopsis pinacola. It's a perennial, so the part of the bracket that I leave on the tree will keep growing and putting on more layers over the years. Here's a mushroom that a lot of people go out looking for. It's one of the chanterelles, but this one is a mess. When I stopped by this same place a month earlier, these chanterelles were in great shape 
but there's been a lot of rain and chanterelles just keep slowly expanding and growing and getting waterlogged as the season comes to an end. Now everybody has a different cutoff of when they think a mushroom is too old or not good to eat, but I think it's always worth taking a closer look at these waterlogged ones. There's starting to be a little mold down here at the bottom. That's the end of the road for old Shannon Trail. Would you have made a different decision than I did about this? I did find some chanterelles in a lot better shape, but the light was getting low and nobody wants to get caught in a deep forest when the sun is going down. I'll have to show them to you back in the kitchen. We have one last stop to get some fresh spring water that I'll use with the edge of that red belted conch bracket. So let's head home and take a look at what I picked up. I want to stress that just because you see a mushroom in one of my trays here, it does not mean it's edible. Sure, I bring home some mushrooms to eat, but I bring other mushrooms home to really look at them over a few days to study and learn and keep my eyes and my brain trained on what the different mushrooms are. The mushroom that takes the longest time to prepare for this dinner are those cat's tongues. So I started with them in the morning. If you know me, you know I like to pick clean, but with these cat's tongues, it's hard not to get needles and other debris in them, so I have to rinse them off. Then I set them out to dry while I make a simple syrup out of sugar and water that I put on the stove to boil. Then I add the juice of a lime. Once that lime syrup is boiling and cooked down, I add the cat's tongues. I'm only using the biggest ones because they're gonna shrink down a lot by the time we're done. I had to cook this down to get it to be a syrup rather than just flavored sugar water. It's a better idea just to start with less water. So it's a syrup consistency right away. I simmer those cat's tongues on low until they turn translucent, and then I put them on a dehydrator. This time I experimented with that parchment paper, but it does not work very well. Just straight up on the dehydrator is the best. The next mushroom I'm cooking is that orange conifer jelly mushroom, the Dacromyces. And I said it's not witch's butter. Why isn't it the real witch's butter, Tremella? Well, because Tremella only grows on hardwoods, and I got these off of the trunk of a Douglas fir. Now the witch's butter is a parasite. This one is not. It's saprophobic. It's going to break down that conifer. Now you can see here, do you see right there? That's the point of attachment. That when you first pick it, it's white. I have to rinse these pretty well because they seem to pick up a lot of tiny debris too, just like those cat's tongues. I simmer these in the lime syrup too, but for this dinner, I'm not going to put them in the dehydrator. I'm going to leave them soft and just lay them out on this parchment paper to drip dry. For the red belted conch, I'm going to make a hot drink. All I'm doing is using a grater to get tiny pieces of the conch that I can simmer in boiling water for about a half hour. I'm using that spring water for fun because it's wild water just like the mushrooms are wild. Now I can get the chanterelles going. The first thing is to carefully sort out the chanterelles from some non-chanterelles that I picked for studying, not for eating. That's what happens when you don't pick organized with each kind in their own bag. You have to sort them out. Take a look at the difference between those two things. You can tell, not just the color. That's a chanterelle gill pattern where you can see the gills. They aren't really sharp gills and they kind of go across from each other every now and again. Can you see this? The next thing is to focus just on the chanterelles and to look them over for good quality, especially since this was towards the end of the season. Most of them were in a lot better shape than that giant waterlog one, but there were some that to me seemed too old. See how this stem is squishy? I can press on it and it just collapses. The stem still pulls apart like string cheese inside like chanterelles are supposed to do, but it's just too soft for me. Here's a good look at how the underside of a chanterelle has complex folds and cross veins that are different from a lot of other mushrooms that have regular gills. That is all so typical of chanterelles. They're not sharp like a gill of a regular mushroom. You can see some of that cross hatching in there. That's chanterelle all the way. Once I've wiped off any debris and trimmed the chanterelles, they're ready to cook. I'm dry roasting them in an oven in a cast iron skillet. The thing I like about roasting chanterelles is that they keep their shape and they caramelize and they get crispy on the outside. The roasting cooks off their internal water and concentrates their flavor. You can see how roasting them helps keep their shape. I'm going to try one here, just that little one. Mm. 
It is just good chanterelle flavor. While the chanterelles were roasting, that gave me time to cook the helvellas, those elephant saddles. The biggest precaution is to look every mushroom over to make sure there is no white mold growing on them. They get infected with a hypomyces mold that's related to the mold that parasitizes russula mushrooms to make the delicious lobster mushrooms. Except the parasite of the helvellas is toxic. I need to clean these elfin saddles well too because there can be debris hidden in all those folds. And then I have some identification and edibility information to confirm. You can see there's two lighter colored mushrooms in here. That little one and the great big one. That small one is one of the less common lighter colored Helvella vespertina. That's fine. But that big one is not a Helvella vespertina at all. You can see its cap is more brown and gray, and that stem really flares out like a vase or a pedestal. But it's going to be easier to show you a very clear feature once I parboil this mushroom. See how on this little gray one, the cap is attached to the stem as it goes around the edges? That's the way all the Helvella vespertina are. But look at this big one. See how that cap is attached only at the top? That's distinctive about the Helvella maculata. The trouble is that even though it's well known that the Helvella vespertina are edible, that's not the case for this big one, the Helvella maculata, the fluted brown elfin saddle. Every reference that I have ever been able to find just says their edibility is unknown. So I'm not eating it, just the vespertina ones. I'm putting them in a thin tempura batter, making sure they're coated all over, and then frying them in hot oil, like a deep fry. Since I made these, I've learned that parboiling isn't really necessary, but that's how I first learned how to cook them. Either way, these mushrooms do need to be cooked thoroughly. That's important. And there's my dinner. Roasted chanterelles, fried elfin saddles, with the cat's tongue and conifer jelly for dessert, and red belted conch to drink. Here's a live taste review. That is absolutely good. All of that was delicious. This tea is great. I added the lime and sugar syrup that I had for making the cat's tongues. That really went well in here. And of course, chanterelles are absolutely delicious. They are just a standard great mushroom. It has a mild flavor. Or you have to like a gummy bear. That's a great dessert. I hope things are going well at your place. Thanks for watching. Bye.